I got a word from the Lord. It's time to dive in. Would you stand to your feet really quick? We're going to go to Exodus chapter number three. I'll be reading from the NLT version. Exodus chapter number three. I'll read as much as possible. And we're going to rock and roll. I think I got announcements. I should be good. Have I ran yet? Okay, I've been holding that. Let me, let me stop that right now. Let me deliver, then I can run and shout. Exodus chapter number three. We're going to start at verse number one. Somebody say word. word. The word of the Lord in Exodus chapter number one. It, it might be a little lengthy. I may read a few and I may come back. Verse number one says, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai. Somebody say Sinai. Sinai. That is the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses started in amazement. He stared like, yo, what is this? Because though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Verse number three, this is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. Now, you must understand it was a very common occasion to see a burning bush because it's hot in the desert. But to see it burning and not burn up is a different story. Verse number four. When the Lord saw Moses come to take a closer look, the King James says, when the Bible says that Moses turned to look aside to see, mm, mm, mm. God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here am I, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Ah, I was studying so much today, so I feel loaded. One of the indications of the custom was that to take off your shoes meant to get ready for battle. It just didn't mean honor and holiness. It meant to get ready to fight. No wonder some of y'all take off your earrings and your shoes and get ready to fight. Mm, mm, mm. He says, here am I. Verse number five, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I am the Lord God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look upon God. You remember in those days to look upon God meant that you would lose your life. Next verse, then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry. Oh, God, I can't even get it out. Just look at somebody and say, God heard you. I have heard your cry of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. Verse number eight. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. God delivers you so you can have your own. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey is not only good to you, but it's good for you. <laughs> the land where the Canaanites and the Hittites, it might be a fight now. The Perizzites, the Amorites, the Hittites, and all the other ites and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. I have seen how they harshly abuse or how, they, how, how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Last few verses. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. I must lead my people out of Egypt. It's one thing to go, but it's another thing to have to go to your enemy and tell them to give up God's possessions. 
Last few verses, verse number 11. But Moses protested God. You know, Moses had a speech impediment. You know how it is when God asks you to do something and you bring up your own insecurities as if he's not God, if he's, as if he's not the God who made you and then asks you to give him back what he made. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am, oh God, that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. You're coming out to worship. Some of you want to come out because you want to show off. But God says you're coming out to worship. Last, let, let's go to 13 and 14. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors have sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? Mm. God replied to Moses, I am that I am. This new version says, I am who I am. God says, I am that I am because I am who I am because whoever I am is who you need to beat your enemies. Say this to the people of Israel, I am have sent me to you. I want to use for a subject, we will survive. Father, I pray that you would hide me behind this sacred desk. Let me deliver and upload what you downloaded. In the invincible name of Jesus, amen. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. Life is full of twists and turns and transitions. You can really be here today and then gone tomorrow. America seems to be this burning bush tonight because the blaze of school shootings and so much more seems to be on fire and on trial because our faith is now tested in asking questions, what will calm the blaze and keep us from having another school shooting? The recent events in our world are teaching us that life is but a vapor. It seems like chaos, confusion are the order of the day. Am I the only one who's wondering, Lord, when will it end? Am I the only one who was shocked and amazed yesterday at the news, teary-eyed, holding my hand in one phone and rushing home to hold my wife in the other, trying to keep from bursting in tears because we both were praying and crying at the same time. How can we survive this next day, decade or year or even the next day? Have you ever wondered where is God? I know you too churchy that to be honest, but have you ever wondered, God, why? Has anybody ever asked that question? Why did you allow this to happen? But, for, but see, none of us understand that something is happening every day that we are not aware of. We just were privileged to check it out on CNN and our phones, but something is happening every day. Mm. And so you wonder, where is God? Doesn't he care? Or why did you allow this to happen? None of us seem to understand that God is not surprised by what happened. Number one, he's a very present help in the time of trouble. Number two, he is not a God who cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. God is with you whether you are prospering or whether you are in a hospital bed. God is with you whether you are in a prison cell or whether you are at a morgue. God is with you when you get the promotion, and God is with you when you're grappling to understand what has happened in your life. He knows right where you are. You are still his child. Oh, God. He loves you, and he still wants you. 
He wants to fill you with his love and his peace and his joy and his goodness. The key is, are you willing to step aside to allow God to freely move in you and around you, or do you need to play God and control everything? See, don't be confused by the evil mistakes of men with the love of God. In fact, this is really nothing new, because when we take a look at the book of Exodus, we have stepped over the 50 chapters of the book of Genesis, and those 38,926 words have ended an era of supreme rule, so we thought. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. You remember Joseph had so much favor in Potiphar's house. He had so much favor, even after he gets out of, out of prison, he has so much favor in the presence of Pharaoh that his people now come down to join him in Egypt in the middle of a famine. Do you remember the famine? God provided for them in the family. And it is the family of Jacob and his children who are now 70 deep in Egypt. God is providing for them. But there arose another king of Egypt or Pharaoh who knew not the God of Joseph. Isn't it amazing that favor, when you get it, you got to spin it quickly because it, it doesn't last long? If the favor with this supervisor would match the favor of the last VP, then everything would be okay. But the issue on your job is that you keep getting new people and new assignments. Am I the, oh, oh, am I the only one who's ever worked in corporate America? And every time you get a new boss, you're like, Lord, what happened to all the hard work I've done? The people begin to grow and multiply, and there arose another king, another Pharaoh. And this Pharaoh then says, wait a minute, these Hebrews, these Israelites, they're having babies, they're lively, and if they keep growing, they're growing more than the Egyptians, unless we control them, they will rise up in strength and dominate us. Because evil people think evil things. Oh, God. That's what they're afraid of right now because you're growing. Oh. Let me speak to every abusive woman in a relationship. The, the issue is that when you start growing, now he starts trying to control. Oh, never mind. You've never been there. The issue, fellas, in the relationship is, oh, 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 the women look at me. Don't you say that. Don't you say that. Women can be abusive too. Women can be controlling too because when you start growing out of the shell, nothing can hold you but the place of God that he has for you. The Israelites were growing and growing and growing, so they set up taskmasters in Exodus chapter number one. They said, let's control them. We got to give them, you know what? They should make bricks. They gave them quotas. They should make bricks without straw. Some of you are taking little, but it's becoming much in the master's hand. Some of you, there's no way that you should be surviving right now. Some of you, there's no way that you should be making it on the income that you're making on, but somehow God gives you extra hand fills on purpose. And so this Pharaoh, wait a minute, this Pharaoh now gives a decree to kill all the male children. Can I have all the men stand up? This is no new assignment, brothers. The enemy has always been after you because when you stand in your rightful place as a man, a priest, a prophet, and a king of your home, nothing can stop you. That's what the enemy's about in that porn. That's what he's trying to do by pulling you away. That's what he's trying to do by holding your, your self-esteem low when you're not making what you think you ought to be making. Because the enemy is after headship. Because if he can cut off the head, the body will follow. So he wants to destroy the men so he can disappoint the woman. But oftentimes he will use you to turn on her because he's trying to distract you from your purpose. Oh, y'all going to get me started real early. There is an assignment on your life. If you're a man in this place, you ought to be filled with prayer, praise, worship. You ought to be the first ones to come to the altar. You ought to be the first ones when the door opens up. You ought to be the first ones saying, we will serve the Lord. It, look, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The king, the new Pharaoh, was after the male child. He says, kill all of them. He said, let the women live, let the girls live, but kill the boys. You know why he was trying to kill the boys? Because when testosterone is mixed with the Holy Ghost, then it's something that cannot be controlled. 
oh, I'm not afraid. I'm going to take my time. Let me say something. The Holy Ghost sat on me today, and I couldn't do anything but just get filled. But I'm getting ready to overflow what he gave me to give you. You are a king of the Most High God. Pick your head up. Square your shoulders up. God is with you. Oh, if you're watching me online, God is with you in that relationship. He's with you in the job. He's with you when you don't feel like a man. He's with you when you got a felony and a misdemeanor and they won't hire you because God is just saying, wait a minute, that's not the place I want you to get your CDL. That's not the place I want you to start an LLC. That's not the place I want you to have a sole proprietorship. That's not the place I want you to be an accountant. That's not the place I want you to have a tax service. I wish I had a man who, would, who, who believed God for entrepreneurship. Because it's your assignment to take over. We didn't come to take sides. We came to take over. But when you take over, you have to balance it out because you got to bring your sisters with you. And what has happened right now, because some of us have held women down for so long, this is the year of the woman. Oh, God. Don't get mad at me, brothers. Come on, you ought to be shouting. And because this is the year of the woman, God is saying, I'm liberating my bride, which is like my church. I'm letting them be free so we can all join together in holiness. When the house is unified, oh God, am I off? Stop. When the house is unified, then God is glorified. But the Pharaoh says, no, 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 no. I want you to kill every male child. But Shipper and Pua said, uh-uh. They, 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 they tricked him. They said, you know what? The, these Hebrew women are lively. They just keep having babies. And, and we can't get to them. And they keep having babies because it's something when the placenta is full with an anointing. And they just keep having babies. They keep having babies. These were mighty men who were jumping out because the purpose of God was to begin to make sure that the Israelites were leaders. And so he says, okay, y'all tricked me. Chapter 1. We're just still in chapter 1. It's your Bible study. Y'all okay? We all right? They say, y'all tricked me. Now, notice something. If you can see in the sanctuary, you might not be able to see it online. These men are still standing. They are standing because God has called them to be on guard. And even while Pharaoh was on guard trying to see if the male child was born and try to kill him, there were other men on guard, I believe, praying. I don't want to put anything in the center text. It's not that, that's not in the text, but I just wonder how they were praying. If we would ever get on one accord in prayer. He says, I'll fix it. So now that they are born, whenever they are born, now the male children must be thrown into the Nile River. I have been to Africa, and when if you study the Nile River, it's one of the rivers that has a reverse thing in it. Most rivers flow from north to south, but the Nile River has a tendency to go from south to north. God is getting ready to reverse things. God's getting ready to switch things. Notice when currents don't seem to be flowing towards you and they're flowing away from you. If they, see, you want everything to flow to you, but when God flows it away from you, that means you got to go stand in the promise of what he's calling you to go to. Her. I feel a prophetic message in my spirit. Because you've been wanting the prosperity to come to you. He said, no, 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 the Nile River is different. It's going to flow from south to north. You've been waiting for it to come up. Oh, God. You, you've been waiting for it to come, uh, uh, like, downstream to you. But God said, no, 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 I need you to go upstream in this season. He says, throw them in the river. So Moses' mother, well, first of all, this unnamed man marries a Levite woman. <laughs> Levites were part of the priesthood. We don't have the full time to extrapolate that or, ex or really exegete it. Let's just say they were part of the ministry of God. So this man marries a woman who has a lineage of prayer. Where are the women at? Now, I wish I had the women who would stand and give God glory. Where are the real women at? Mm -hmm. Now, you see, there's a difference. The men didn't say much, but they stood. The women stood, but they said much. Men are nonverbal communicators because our presence alone should back the enemy up. But women are verbal communicators. Though they don't have the presence, they got the word. If you put your word with his presence, God, I got this. Let me, let me, let me, let me bring this, let me, let me bring this together. And so the, oh God. So the women said, uh, 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 uh. Well, they start having babies, they're too lively. He says, okay, throw them in the Nile. But the women, I believe, had Holy Ghost intelligence. So Moses' mother, 
I believe her name's Jochebed, if I'm correct. Moses' mother said, you know what? Let me pitch this with some stuff. Let, let me take some stuff. Are there any women who've ever had to take some stuff and, and pull it together? She says, I don't, y'all know how y'all are about your babies. Come on now. A woman will fight you tooth and nail over her son. Woo! Over her babies in general, but her son? What? That's my little man. I, they will fight you tooth and nail over their son. But it's not in the fight physically, sisters. Oh, God. Some of y'all been trying to put your hands on dirty stuff. God said, back it up. Uh, I'm going to tie it up in just a moment. (laughs) Because Moses' shoes sometimes are your hands because it's both clay. And you got to take your hands off what is holy and let God do what he's going to do. But she puts her hands on some bulrushes. And she starts saying, you know what, what I, I got to make some pitch here. Let me, let me, I'll figure out something. Maybe this mud is sticky and I'm going to make a baby tabernacle. And I'm going to, because, see, <laughs> we later give Moses credit for the tabernacle. And I believe he went up and heard from God to build the dwelling place for God. But I believe the first dwelling place was built by Moses' mother. This is my own personal belief. She builds a dwelling place, a small tabernacle, a basket, a basket that was strong enough to hold the eight to 10 pound baby. How are you making bricks with no straw? How are you making a basket without glue? God told me to tell you that there's more in your mind and your hand than you think. I almost titled this message, Use Your Mind, because some of you have not, God told me, he said, some of my people have not been using their mind, and they have been spiritually blind when if they would just open up their mind, I've got new possibilities. You're too gifted to be broke. You're too anointed to be in the situation you're in. You're too intelligent, filled with God's glory to not find a way out. Moses' mother finds a way out. That's why I like women. It didn't say she got out. She's still in slavery and bondage, but she blessed her baby to get out. That's a shouting moment right there because some of you, you feel trapped, but you know your baby's going to be the next generation going forward. And then conversely, God is saying, your baby getting out is a sign of you coming out too. She makes this basket and puts it in the Nile. This is chapter number two, Exodus. She puts this baby in the basket and this baby is moving and flowing along the Nile. Can you see it? (laughs) Moses had never been away from his mother's breasts. Amidst the cry, I wonder if Moses' sister heard his cry, followed down the Nile River and said, wait a minute, let me follow him and see who picks him up. Interesting enough, Pharaoh's daughter now says, who's this baby? I wonder, she said, I just wonder, she said, who's this baby crying? This goodly looking child. And then now the Moses' sister said, would you like for me to get somebody to nurse this baby? The text says, would you like for me to get somebody to nurse this baby. Typically, you know a baby needs to be nursed because the baby's doing what? Crying. Let me go get somebody. Let me go get a Hebrew to nurse the baby. And who's the Hebrew? The mother. God told me to tell you that that you sow, you're getting ready to reap. She trusted God in faith. How are we going to survive this? I have no idea, but I'm going to make this pitch in this basket, and I'm going to let Moses float. And somehow, this new Pharaoh's daughter doesn't have his heart. I believe she had the heart of God. And says, this baby, we can't kill this one. 
I know you said throw all the babies. We can't kill this one. What is it about you that you still hear? And Moses has the privilege of now growing up in Pharaoh's house. This man, this baby boy, goes from being in bondage in slavery to a palace. What I hear in the spirit is you get, it's getting ready to happen overnight. <laughs> do I, anybody watching me online, do I have any overnight believers? See, for what you need, that's going to be a generational download. That's going to be an abundance. That's going to be an overflow. You need it to reign generationally. For what you need, you don't just need a million dollars. You need an overflow. Some of you need cryptocurrency. Some of you need real estate. Some of you need 401ks, 403bs. You need annuity, stocks, and bonds. Oh, you need it all. Because for what God wants to do in your family, your job is not enough. That's why you're frustrated, because you're working, but it's not your calling. Your work is what you do to survive. Your calling is what you'll be forever. What is your calling? I'm going to get to purpose in just a moment, but I opened it up, so let me just, let me just start here. Purpose, and we have a slide on purpose, I believe. Purpose is why God created you. What's purpose? You can type in the chat. What's purpose? But destiny is what you do with your purpose. You've been asking for destiny without understanding your purpose. Your purpose is why he created you. The purpose is the thing that you would do if money didn't matter. The, your purpose is the thing that you would do for free. Some of you know how to type. Some of you know how to braid hair. Some of you know how to cut. Oh, God. You, listen, you can fade a brother up with the quickness. Some of you know how to do designs. Some of you know how to do boutiques. Am I in the room? Some of you have the gift of care. That's why you care for children. Some of you have the gift of teaching. That's why you like to teach. Some of you have the gift of care. That's why you do hospitals. Some of you have the gift to clean, and, you're, and, and they overlook you because you're a custodial worker, but they don't realize that you're getting ready to have employees that clean buildings in downtown Dallas and in cities across America. Some of you have the gift of speech, and you like to speak, and you have a distinct voice, or you have a nice, melodious voice. And some of you, you're just beautiful, and it's just God's glory. Brothers, this I learned a long time ago when I was single. I looked at a woman. I said, Lord, this woman is beautiful. And I asked my mentor, I said, how do I keep from looking at a woman and not lusting? He said, this is what God says. He says, first of all, that's my glory. He said, the first look is on you. The second look, that's on me. It went over your head. It went over your head. Don't let the glory of God distract you from your purpose. Some of you are going to be optometrists. Some of you are going to be accountants. Can I just talk to you for a moment? Some of you are going to be engineers, zoologists, botanists. Some of you are going to be veterinarians. Some of you, you're going to be investors. Some of you, you're going to be bankers. Some of you, you're going to be writers. Some of you, you're going to be thinkers and scholars. You're going to just be able to sit at think tables. Some of you, you're gifted to influence. You're going to be politicians. What? is your purpose. See, Moses had this thing with struggling what his purpose is because he didn't know his identity. Identity is about the fingerprint that you have. Nobody has your fingerprint. You are gifted beyond measure. You're you're peculiar. No one has your follicles. No one has your hair type. No one has your exact attitude. That's why you get moody every now and then just to show who you are because you're different. You're cut different. You're eclectic. You are called beyond measure. Your purpose is why God created you, but your identity often gets in trouble with your purpose. Moses was struggling with his identity because even though he was in the palace, and some, God has raised some of you up in these nice corporate jobs. I want to speak to the people who are successful. We always speak to the people who seem to be poor or downtrodden, but some of you have been successful and you've had good success, but you don't understand it because you have an identity for fitting in with your own people. It is the same Moses who is now seeing an Egyptian beat a Hebrew 
because he knows from being nursed by his mother that he was kin to the people in the field who were slaves. He rises up and kills out of anger because he does not know how to control his anger, fellas. See, anger is to produce anointing. Anger is not to destroy. Anger is not for anguish. Anger is for motivation and inspiration. you just been using anger the wrong way. you got to reverse it. Because he's immature like many men. Oh, y'all was shouting real good. And because Moses is immature, now he kills an Egyptian over a Hebrew, but he's in, a, he, he's in the Egyptian palace. Why would you kill a Hebrew over what an Egyptian was doing, but you're living in an Egyptian's house? Because some of you can't get away from where you came from. And where you came from is a clue what you're called a conquer. You see it as conflict at the family reunion. You see it as conflict because you don't understand why they're still cussing and drinking and smoking and acting a fool. It bothers you because that's where you're from. It bothers you because you're called to change it and rearrange it. But you cannot do it by destroying everything that you think is against your identity. Could it be possible that Moses didn't quite fit in the palace and he didn't quite fit in the field? What do you do when you're in between mountains? What do you do when you're in between blessings? Some of you are in between greatness and poverty and you don't understand it because you said, well, God, just let me be all the way over here or let me be all the way over there. But God says, "Uh -uh, uh-uh-uh-uh, I need you to keep walking by faith. I call it God job security, which means you will always need to trust God with faith for clarity. Is this okay? We're just walking through the text. Moses, oh, y'all, good God, if y'all could see this room, y'all hungry. Let me, let me drop it then. Moses rises up to kill an Egyptian over a Hebrew, which means that he's really a deliverer who doesn't know his power. But this is not the way to deliver. I don't know who I'm talking to. It just dropped in my spirit. You got the right passion but the pain is causing you to act out inappropriately. Pain is the paintbrush of greatness. Everybody has this great potential, but they don't often perform at the level of their potential because in between po potential and performance is often pain. And many of us are at a cross situation. I know you smell good, you look good, or maybe you're hiding online right now, but there's a secret pain somewhere in your life. I've been preaching too many years not to know that when I walk in the sanctuary, there's always somebody at their breaking point, not because of other people, but because of their own personal pain. Because you keep rehearsing the pain of your past rather than the faith of your future. And Moses rises up and he kills what he should have confronted. Are you killing things that God has blessed you to confront? Oh, this is going to be a thinking message today. And Moses is saying to himself, how will I survive in a palace watching my people being punished? That's what it's like for some of you who your managers your VPs, you oversee people and you really want them to get it. You're like, the executives want it this way. The management wants it this way, but they don't understand because they have not been exposed to your level. So Moses' assignment is getting ready to be exposure. Come on, sir. Before he can expose the people, God has to expose him. So God says, let me take you from this side of the Nile to the other side of the Nile because I want to expose you to greatness. Exposure creates exponential blessings because the excellency of God has always something to do with transition and transformation. But you want to be transformed where you are. <sighs> if comfort would come to our doorstep and we would just let them in, everything would be okay. But comfort doesn't knock on your door. It often comes in chaos. 
So 40 years, Moses is running because he's lost in his identity. He doesn't know who he is. The reason he doesn't know who he is because he was not raised in the field, but something troubled him about his people in the field being abused. The reason he doesn't know who he is is because he was raised in the palace, but he knew he wasn't an Egyptian. What do you do when you don't fit in one place or the other? What do you do when the group, the club, the clique, you seem to be an oddball? What do you do when you can't fit in? Forty years, Moses, oh God, he was raised for 40 years in the palace, so it was steeped in him. He kills the Egyptian, and he's now on the run for another 40 years. Are you following me thus far? 40 years in Pharaoh's house, 40 years on the backside of the desert. But it's in this isolation that God would bring revelation. And you're frustrated because you're isolated and, you, and it seems like it's a dark time, but you don't understand that the depression is pushing you to destiny. You don't understand that the anxiety and the anguish is pushing you to have an anointing like no other. Because it's only God that can work on you in the dark. <laughs> see, some of you trying to see in the light. Oh God, I don't know who I'm talking to right now. You're in a dark place, dark abuse dark job issues, dark money trouble, dark finances, dark dreams, dark education. You say, I, I don't have the education because it's in the darkness that God is, rec he's, he's trying to show you how to recognize his light. See, you want, you want to appreciate, close your eyes for a moment. You want to appreciate the light until your eyes have been closed in the dark for so long. When your eyes are closed, you're just looking for one moment to see a ray of hope and light. One moment. Because 40 years, he was really blind in the palace. I don't see where any Egyptian was breaking down or talking to him saying, you belong to us. I don't see in the text where the, the Hebrews were saying, well, no, you come from us. 40 years in the palace, 40 years on the back side of the desert. His eyes are closed. He's in a dark place. And he's wondering, how will I survive? The desert is hot in the day. I'm from West Texas, baby. It's 120 in the day. And it's 50 degrees at night. How do I survive with the cockatrice? How do I survive with the side-wandering snakes? How do I survive when there is no water and it's hilly and it's dirty? How will I survive when I'm climbing up rocks and mountains and hills? How will I survive when there's very few vegetation, very few animals in the desert? How will I make it? How will I survive? And all the while, God is teaching him to learn how to survive. He's teaching him with his eyes closed to recognize like. It is the same Moses who was in a dark place who recognized the light of a burning bush. Oh, I'm not lost. We're back at the same place. It is the burning bush where Moses said, what is this? This is light. The bush was burning, but not consumed. It's one thing to see a burning bush because it's hot. It's another thing for the bush to be burning and no ashes. Oh, God, I don't know who I'm talking to right now. People saw you burning up, but there were no ashes. People saw you burning. They thought you were going to die. They thought you were going to kill yourself, but no ashes. People saw them talk about you. They saw you lose your house. They saw you file bankruptcy. They saw you out of money. They saw you go to jail, but no ashes. People saw you go through divorce. People saw the attacks on your body, blood everywhere. They saw the cancer, but no ashes. They saw the lupus, but no ashes. They saw the fibroid cysts, but no ashes. They saw the obesity, but no ashes. 
They saw the dialysis, but no ashes. What is it about you that you haven't burnt up? Ah, it's a sign. It's a clue. It's a clue that God is talking to do. He's talking to you. What do you do when you're burning and you wish the fire would stop? The fire doesn't stop, but it doesn't seem like enough water is coming either. What do you do when you're on fire and you can't tell nobody? I don't see in the text where Moses ever talked to anybody when he saw the burning bush. What I see is Moses saying, look at this amazement. Look at this bush. Watch how Moses, he's been in the desert and darkness so long that he's now praising God for light. Because the Bible says when God saw that he turned, that's the issue right there. You've been trying to do things your own way, but God said, if you just turn. You've been trying to go on your own strip, God said, if you would just turn. Turning is a directional right turn of a right angle to push you in a whole nother dimension of where you're going. Rejection from man is always selection from God, but rejection from man is also direction from God. The rejection of the palace uh, Y'all not with me. I failed to mention the fact that Moses, after he killed an Egyptian, he said, you know what? Let me hide him in the sand because he didn't think anybody would know. But somebody saw him. And when he sees his Hebrew people, he sees the Hebrew beating another. He said, wait, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. He said, you shouldn't do the wrong. He said, what you going to do? You going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? So he's ostracized by not only the Egyptians, but he doesn't fit in with the Hebrews. Don't you understand? I'm trying to help you. Yes. Some of you are sick and tired of people that you keep trying to help, and it's draining you, and they don't even see your heart. You spent money on it. You built them out of jail. Oh, am I, am I the only one? You're trying everything you can. You went to that house late at night. You prayed. You told her to leave the man. You told him to leave the scandalous woman, but they refuse. Because God will always isolate you so that you might understand the revelation of who he is. Moses sees this burning bush, and the bush is on fire. It's a thinking message tonight. And it's not consumed. And I thought about this. I said, wait a minute. Is it the bush or is it me? In the text in the New Gospels, Elder... When Jesus lays hands on a man, he said, I see men walking as trees. Because some of us have been uprooted because the heat we couldn't take, so we ran from the situation. If you run, you can't be delivered. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. I'm not telling you to stay in an abusive relationship, so let's just talk about that right now. I'm not telling you to stay in an ungodly situation, but for some of you, you know God planted you where he planted you. And the heat comes, when trouble comes, you want to run, but God said you're made in a furnace of affliction. You're a black, <laughs> you're in a black cold situation, and God says, I need you to become a diamond. You cannot become a diamond if I don't send the heat on you. Some of you, you got to take the heat. We messed up with the saying, if you, if, what is it? If you can't take the heat, do what? But some of us need to go get cooked a little bit more. <laughs> Moses sees this burning bush. And to me, <laughs> I'm a thinker. And to me, I'm just wondering, this bush has thorns in it. This bush has a lot of thorns in it. And it's burning, but it's not consumed. I, I won't bother that, but I just see other trees in the text where there were thorns. Because sometimes you can be in a burning, crucified type situation and think you need to leave. Even Jesus in the garden said, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Because even the flesh of Jesus didn't want to face the thorns. I wonder how the thorns felt from the burning bush being burned up. As we think through this text, this burning bush is on fire. 
Moses turns aside, and then God says, that's where I want you. Because Moses says, look at this amazing bush. It just depends on the vantage point and how you see it. It just depends on the vantage point and how you see your situation. You can see your situation as opportunity, or you can see your situation as devastation. How do you want your story to end? Moses sees the burning bush, and I want to insert this right here. For him to turn aside to notice the burning bush was a praise. I believe it was a praise to God. We've, we've lost our psalms. We always quote psalms. The, the great psalm, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. We always talk about the greatest. But what about Psalm 10? Why does thou stand so far off in times of trouble? What about the Psalms that in Psalm 7? He says, make haste, make haste, make haste. He's asking continually, God, deliver me from this tough situation. What about Psalm 22? He says, my God, my God. Even David sees the coming of the crucifixion of Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because we have to keep going on Psalm 22. It says, he inhabits the praises of his people. What about Psalms 51? Have mercy on me, O Lord. You've been talking about everybody else, but have you ever asked God for your own mercy? And Moses figures out a way to survive in the desert. I believe it was through praise. I believe him seeing the burning bush was a praise moment. Lord, have mercy. I believe it was a praise moment because it's the praise that builds up who we are. You cannot step over the pain without praise in order to get to the power of what God has for you. When you get to the power of what God has for you, that means you realize who God is. But Moses said, I don't know who you are. God, who are you? You're sending me down there to go. I feel like I got the power. We have a slide on power. You feel like, oh, I got the power. But what is power without identification of where the power comes from? He says, who shall I say sent me? God says, I am that I am. I am the lily of the valley. I am the bright and morning star. I am the resurrection and the life. I am for everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. I am the king of kings. I am the glory of glories. I am the great I am. The same God who created cold Antarctica is the same God who created the equator in Africa. The same God who allowed a, bubble, a bumblebee to fly in West Texas is the same God who allows uh, the butterfly in Australia to fly free. The same God who created the Himalayas is the same God who created the Sahara Desert. Your God is ubiquitous. He's everywhere all the time, at the same time, anytime. Your God, before, oh God, before you ever even existed, before your mother kissed your grandfather, before, before your mother kissed your father or your grandfather, to kiss your grandmother. He was God Almighty. He's God in the middle of your storm. He's God in the middle of your trouble. It wasn't a car accident that was going to take you up because God was right there with you. Oh, I wish I had somebody who would praise him because you know he's God. He says, I am that I am, but you've been dumbing me down because you think I'm like other people. This, this is a thinking message. I, I just, I'm, I'm, my, my notes are, yeah, th this is the thinking. And, and God's going to give Moses a strategy here. He says, I am that I am. That means it's whatever you need. Why are we bound when God is saying, I am that I am? What do you need? I'm going to provide it. I am. <laughs> I am. Shout out something you need right now. Oh, y'all afraid to shout it out. Y'all afraid that you're afraid to really shout out what you really need. What do you need? I'm sorry, what do you need? I'm, I, I can't hear you. You ought to type what you need in the chat because he says, I am that I am. But until you confess what you need, you can't say I am in the situation. Moses then begins to say, God, you know I can't talk. What am I going to do? And this is what I call S4. 
God gives Moses a strategy. I want to read you a definition of the word strategy. Strategy, this is Holy Ghost notes. You might not find this at Webster. Strategy is an equation for success. The first S. Somebody shout strategy. You would be much further along if you had one thing. Just a strategy. You've been wandering in the desert for so long, not knowing that all you needed to ask God for was a strategy. The second S is structure. Type that in the chat. First S is strategy. The second is structure. A structure is a guaranteed weight load for pressure and growth. So God's going to give some of you a strategy, and some of you say, I got the strategy, but many of you don't have a structure. A strategy without a structure means that God will bless you and you will not keep it. It's not that you're not making enough money. It's what you're doing with it at the end of the day. I call it S4, strategy, structure. The third S, really quick, is a system. A system is an engine or invitation for sustained success. God says, I'm going to give you a strategy because you'll have the equation for success. I'm going to give you a structure to handle the weight load, and then I'm going to create a system so that you'll always have money coming in and out. He said, what does this have to do with the text? Pause right there. I'm going to come right back to you. The last S is solution. Somebody say solution. Solution is an answer, not just a problem. Oh, God. Solution is an answer, not just... See, a solution is not only an answer to a problem, but it is the full sustainability of the problem that you have. When God gives you a solution, it's also a resolution for everything that ever tried to trouble you because the solution stops the trouble. It stops whatever was. The issue is, some of you have been putting Band-Aids on gunshot wounds. You've got to ask God for a solution. Now, where's the solution in the text? Notice here, God then in the later verses said, this is what I want you to do. Moses, I want you to go down to the elders first and announce to the elders what I'm getting ready to do, that I'm getting ready to deliver the children of Israel out of the hand of the Egyptians. That's strategy. The reason is strategy because there are pressure points in the earth. There are pressure points in particular systems. You've been playing checkers, but you haven't been playing chess. He says if you go to the elders first, then the, er the elders would then be the structure that will carry out the system that would then bring a solution for the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. That's not making sense to you. God says, okay. Okay, now you got the structure, you got the strategy, you got the system, and I've given you a solution. But then now it's going to be Holy Ghost miracles and power. What does that come from? The Holy Ghost miracles and power says, but, but Pharaoh's not going to go without a mighty hand. He's not going to go unless he's forced to go. He says, so I'm going to send plagues to help you. So some of you, you've done all that you can do. Now it's time for the Holy Ghost to come in. You've done all you can do. Now it's time for miracle signs and wonders. Never think you are the answer to every problem. Some of you have been working, you've been checkers, you've been checkers, but you haven't seen the spirit of chess. God's getting ready to overshadow your darkness. Okay, this is, this is bad. This is just like, this is bad. I'm studying this thing and it's called the thalamus. I don't know if we have it. Your brain... I'm a thinker, so if you just, you know, we, we shout it, and we, I think we may shout at the end. Your brain, your cerebrum, your cerebellum, your septal lobe, your brain has so many different molecules, protons, electrons, neutrons. Your brain is powerful, but you've not been using it all because you don't think you can get out of survival mode because you feel like you're overloaded. The thalamus is in the very middle and center of your brain. Think with me. 
Where's the thalamus? It's in the what? The middle. It's the center of my brain. This thalamus, the job of the thalamus is to allow messages to come in and say, wait a minute, do we need this? Well, no, send this here. Do we need this? No, react here. Is there a fly on your arm? You don't need to really hit it. Maybe you can shoo it away. Is there, is there, is there um, impending danger? Maybe we need to run. Maybe we need to say, here, you need to make a decision over here. You, should you buy this clothes? Uh, should you create this company? The thalamus' job is to take the central thoughts and send them out all over your body. But as I'm studying the thalamus, God begins to speak to me about water. And when I talk about water, this is just Holy Ghost stuff. Can I, um, this is the first time I'm dropping it. Can I trust you with it? Y'all sure? Okay. Let me know in the chat. Or can you trust me? This thalamus' job is to wash away thoughts that you don't need. And so I'm studying water, and God says, these are Holy Ghost notes, y'all, 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 we okay? Yeah. It's just me and you and like 100,000 people online. We okay? We... Water helps your brain cells communicate with each other. It clears out the toxins and waste that impairs brain function and carries nutrients to your brain. And the Lord began to tell me that some of you have not been drinking enough water. Naturally, you've not been drinking enough water, so the thalamus is not working properly, and you feel overloaded off of basic stuff because you haven't been drinking water. And so when you go to the doctor, they say, how much water have you drank? You're supposed to drink half your body weight in ounces. Am I, am I correct on that? And then the Lord say, think again, son. I said, Lord, I don't understand. They're going to think I'm crazy. They're going to think I'm crazy. I'm kind of weird, Lord. Uh, they're going to, you know, I got a degree. I've been to grad school. But they're going to think I'm crazy, Lord. And he said, now tie it into the text. Moses had the uncanny ability as a baby <laughs> to flow in water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because Moses was insulated, we're all back at the same place now, what the sisters said. You remember Moses' mother made a basket. She made a tabernacle, and she was teaching him how to handle his brain cells. She was teaching him how to, she was teaching, training the thalamus in his body, don't let everything come in because some stuff has to be washed out. And the Lord told me to tell you, the reason you don't think you would survive is because there's too much water in your brain, and it's mixed with dirty things. What are dirty things? It's dirty thoughts. So when God gave me the message, we will survive, the reason why we will survive is because we're going to commit to washing out everything that's dirty that's coming our mind. The only way that Moses will be able to say, Lord, that's a burning bush, because his mind was clear in a desert situation. You're in a desert situation. You've been isolated, but you haven't cleared out your mind. There is only one thing you need to do is set your affections on things above. Wait a minute. Be oh, oh. Let this mind that be in you that was also in Christ, let this mind that was in Christ also be in you. Are y'all following me so far? So the mind has to be renewed. Moses' mind is renewed from the palace. Moses' mind is renewed from the desert when God says, I am that I am. I can be your brain if your brain will allow me to function and you will clear up every dirty thought that ever tried to come and destroy you. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but God told me you would survive, but it's your own participation in the survival that is going to deliver you from where you are. You've got to get rid of some things in your mind. I dare you to stand on your feet and give God glory and to wash out every dirty thing that was in your mind. The enemy said foul things. The enemy said you're going to be in bondage and slavery. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's not that God couldn't use Moses to deliver the Israelites out of slavery. It's that their mind was still in captivity. Your mind, your, your, your body's out, but your mind is stuck. So when the Lord gave me the message, we shall survive, we will survive if our mind is able to thrive. I took a long time to say something simple, but I'm telling you, if you would get this principle, God says the thalamus has been weighted down with 30 things. And all of a sudden, when I was about to close, I'll, I'll be preaching to myself sometimes. And I was, watch out, what, y'all standing, but watch out. When, when I was about to close, the Holy Ghost said, don't close it. 
Don't, don't you close it because the thalamus is in the middle. And I told you that water has to come to the brain. I said, well, God, doesn't it seem like if you had too much water in your brain, there'd be something wrong with it? He said, your brain needs water. I said, okay, well, what do you mean, God? He says, go back to the tabernacle. You remember Moses was now put in a baby basket, which was like a tabernacle, and floated down the river. And the Lord started to tell He said, go back and study the tabernacle. You, some of you remember the brazen altar, which is where the animal was sacrificed. Y'all remember that? Represents salvation. But the next step in that outer court is the brazen labor. And in the brazen labor, after there has been enough sacrifice, you sacrifice everything you can. You sowed the seeds. You prayed. You sacrificed. You labored. And now God said, all you need to do is wash your mind. I don't know who I'm talking to. This is a season to wash your mind. Every dirty thought, every foul thought, everything that told you to quit, everything that told you to give up. Because you don't know who you are because dirty thoughts have crept in your mind. Who are you? What's the clean? Who are you? Where is the clean version of you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. I know. It's a thinking message. And this is Bible study. And when I study the text, God began to show me that because God identified who he was, then now Moses could understand who he was. If God is I am that I am, then maybe I am a deliverer. Maybe I am a leader. Maybe you are better than you think you are, but there's clutter and dirt in your mind, and you just need to go to the labor of the center of your brain and wash out every dirty thing. The priest would have to come to the labor to wash their hands of the blood. And some of you haven't forgiven yourself, and you got blood on your hands. You got blood on your minds. And God said, if you would bring everything to the center of my will and wash yourself. It's a thinking message. You say, we will survive, Pastor? Yes, we. Who are we? We are the brain cells that you have allowed to seem like they were on life support. And God says, you will live again. Every brain cell will live again. Your situation pushed you down, but God says, I've raised you up. I don't know who I'm talking to. You will survive. I'm talking to an America who is tired of school shootings, but the Lord told me to tell you, we will survive. I may be talking to somebody who can't make ends meet, but God told me to tell you, you will survive. I may be talking to somebody in a hospital bed, but God told me to tell you, you will survive. You will. Su Wait a minute. After all, we are storm survivors. And before we close, I want you to be honest with yourself as our worship team comes. Preacher's got six closes. This is probably my first of 20. I want you to be honest with yourself. Are you in some secret area asking God to help you survive? Because some of you are half dead like the burning bush, but yet you're half alive. If you would take the part of you that's moving and put it on the part of you that seems to be dead, this is the place at the potter's house, whether you're watching online or at this altar, where dreams will be birthed again. I almost couldn't get out of the offering moment because I have seen dreams come to pass right here at the potter's house. As one day, there's a man named Jesus. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. On a cross, he died. But three days later, he got up with all power in his hand. Maybe you're watching us online. You can call 1-800-BISHOP-2. Or if you're in the sanctuary 
and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, meet me at this altar. But most times what I see, it's not that people don't believe in Jesus and that he was crucified and that he rose again. You don't believe in you. And so I'm sitting here saying, we will survive, but you don't include yourself in the we. Because somehow you have subtracted yourself from greatness. We talked about so many things tonight. But if God could use Moses, a murderer, you won't forgive yourself? If God could use somebody who ran away from a problem, but yet ran into a promise, you don't think God is speaking to you? God was setting Moses up all the while for generational success. Some of you are being fought because you're going to be the one to deliver your entire family. That's why the attack is so great on who you are. And your brain has been just clogged down with dirty thoughts. I wonder how many times the basket of Moses had to go over muddy places into the flow of the water of what God wanted to do in his life. Bible study is where we immerse ourselves into the water of his word. And I stopped by tonight to tell you that God has a strategy for you. He's going to give you a structure. For some of you, a structure is counseling. Some of you, God's going to give a system. For, for some of you, your system is a budget. For some of you, God's going to give you a solution. Apply for this job. Change to this career. Move to this department where they'll treat you better and really appreciate your gift and your self-worth. And when these strategies, these structures, these systems become solutions for the glory of God, you will understand why he created you. Don't let the rejection of people make you think you're not called, make you think your purpose is not what it is. You know the thing that you dreamed about as a kid. What's holding you back? God has given you a blank check. It's up to you to cash it by faith. Step over the pain into the promise of the power of the Almighty God who is going to promulgate your full success. I see visions being birthed. I see books being written. I see companies and organizations being designed. I see God raising up millionaires in your family. For some of you, it's not this money thing. I see God raising your self-esteem to the fullness of who you are and what he's called you to do.